Hello, friends. Welcome to the monthly I Wonder webinar. I'm Mala Kumar, an editor at I Wonder and a children's book author. For those who are joining us for the first time, I Wonder is a science magazine for middle and high school teachers. It features writings about the many dimensions of teaching and learning of science in class and outside it. This magazine is published in English, Hindi, and Kannada twice a year. If you are a practicing science teacher, we invite you to write for us. To do this, please send your idea in less than 100 words to iwonder at apu.edu.in. If you'd like to receive updates of each webinar and a free print version of each issue, subscribe to us by following the link displayed in the description of this video. You can also catch us on Facebook. As uh, many of you know, on the second Wednesday of every month, we invite authors of an article in I Wonder for a live discussion. For today's webinar, we have with us Ranjit Kumar Dash, author of the article, An Artistic Explanation, from our June 2022 issue. Ranjit is a teacher at Rishi Valley School, Andhra Pradesh. He enjoys bringing together simple experiments, hands-on activities, various forms of artwork, and learning from nature to make the teaching and learning of science interesting. Ranjit, thank you for being with us today. Ranjit? Yes. Uh, thank you for being with us today. Thank you, and it's a pleasure interacting in this platform uh, with so many teachers and educators. I have attended uh, past webinars and has been benefiting immensely in terms of various ideas to experiment myself. Uh, this work has been interesting and quite encouraging for me. And I hope I can offer something and also learn something from this interaction. Thank you. Thank you, Ranjit. Thank you. Uh, before we start, let me give our audience a brief overview of the format of the discussion. For the first 30 minutes, I will ask Ranjit some questions to delve a little deeper into the article. And uh, those of you who've joined us today, please type your questions in the chat box. In the last 30 minutes of the webinar, I will request Ranjit for his responses to these questions. Now we are ready. Uh, Ranjit, your article yes. illustrates an experiential inquiry-based approach to teaching and learning science. For teachers who may be new to this approach, could you tell us what this means? Yeah, personally, it uh, meant a lot of things uh, for me. Um, I felt learning is when uh, we make connections to prior knowledge and the new experiences that happens. Um, also, the fact that young children's appetite for experience is more, much more than just uh, inquiry or any abstract learning. Uh, learning to reason is another vital skill, uh, learning to reason out things. Um, to some, it comes easily. To some, it doesn't come so easily. It's a process. And uh, it's like um, we are learning a concept or subject, but that thing of reasoning is silently uh, operating. It is just like, you know, people say that Saraswati River mm -hmm. is hidden and but flows. So it is just something like that. Um, while concepts and competency is important, far more important, I feel, is to awaken this hidden skill. Uh, it's not different from any other teaching um, uh, classes or teaching lessons. The outcome depends on the learning objectives that we set, the teacher sets for. Uh, that is planning. Uh, Planning also has to be done um, to keep, uh, if we keep these things in mind, um, it can facilitate uh, experiential inquiry-based approach. 
approach. Uh, very often I have seen um, the knowledge or the concept, the idea, and content is given far more important and not the ways of knowing. Um, it, is, it is given, it is there, but it is not brought out very clearly in classrooms. Whereas it should be the other way, I feel, uh, because knowledge is a byproduct of uh, if one learns, it mm -hmm. just it happens. Particularly at middle school level, uh, where children uh, are transitioning from their developmental point of view, uh, the abstract ideas, abstract thinking, dealing with abstract is they're still grappling with. So uh, I felt uh, to introduce some sort of uh, experiential, but also inquiry based uh, things um, and try out this idea, what we are discussing today. So I asked a question to myself, can I design such a session with, uh, and start playing with the idea and see what comes out. This is, this is the uh, gist of the approach and uh, as we go, uh, I will, I think, uh, open more into this. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ranjit. I'm sure we'll go into greater detail uh, as we move along in this webinar. Uh, now, very briefly, could you tell us how does a teacher go about designing such pedagogical approach? Uh, what are some of the things that she must or he must uh, he find helpful for teachers to keep in mind? Just very briefly. Yes, um, the ideas are not that complex. It's simple. Can I do something so that children ask questions in the classroom? And uh, I support, I support, I hold those questions even if I cannot answer all of them. Um, because the tendency, the way their mind works, they get several uh, questions. It's like, if they don't expect it goes out of their mind. Uh, it's like, it's a flow. So um, uh, what, are, what, what can I do about holding those questions? Um, how do I manage so many questions? Once, once I go, go into that path of inviting questions, how do I manage? These are some of the things I grapple, uh, manage so many questions. Can I answer uh, whatever they ask? This is another issue. What if the discussion goes out of context? There are fears also we have. Um, they are real trouble and few things became very obvious to me. Um, bring in um, some activity which can bring little focus into this process. Um, and that binds also, should bind various concepts that I'm planning to deal as an objective. Um, can I also participate or reduce the burden of my own you know, dealing with the questions by designing groups uh, so that they also hear and respond to part of their questions? Um, so the design of you know, group work. So group work involves a collaborative skill. It's not easy, and but it can be done uh, if we carefully uh, facilitate to make the groups. Of course, setting some ground rules mm -hmm. and time time bounded activities, sub activities, I mean, uh, is also uh, quite useful. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ranjit. So a lot of uh, small engagement uh, for the children, for the students, to keep them busy, to keep them asking questions, and so on. Uh, there are many unique things in the way you engage with this approach in the class. Let's start with skills. Uh, so many skills that, uh, you know, inquiry helps students develop the many skills that are commonly known to be important to the practice of science. You point to one that is unusual developing self-awareness by verbalizing gaps in understanding. Uh, what does this mean? Yeah. Um, see, one of the common things that uh, one faces when particularly 
uh, teaching uh, younger middle school, middle school, class six, seven, eight level, is they struggle to express due to limited vocabulary. So it is uh, imperative that we create an ambience of expression. The whole classroom should express. It is also when the student is struggling to express, but let's say a student is able to ask something that action itself should be encouraged. We adult, we can ask questions, but we have vocabularies. But for them, that is missing. So it needs some level of appreciation to even take the courage, ask a wrong question also. It is fine. Um, in that moment, when asked to express their observations, they have a heightened sense of self-awareness that there is a gap. There is a gap which uh, they are unable to express. I meant that the statement of there is, a, you know, there is a self-awareness. There is a gap which they perceive. And if um, if a teacher carefully watches them, mm -hmm. uh, we can uh, fill in their murmurings. They they will blabber out something. We can fill in, give give something for them to express. And that is what I felt is a very very interesting process. Uh, you've actually answered uh, the next couple of questions that I had in mind for you. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, see, later in the article, you describe how students came up with interesting reasons to explain why acid etching may be self-limiting. You say that such reasoning in pre-adolescence may be due to a combination of factors. Could you explain this? Honestly, uh, it is confusing for me too. <laughs> And uh, what the question of what leads to development of good sense of reasoning, uh, I really don't know. I'm, I'm not <laughs> claiming any formula here. Uh, it's it's quite puzzling. Uh, you know, the student may be dull, but after some time, suddenly he starts this sense of reasoning. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe cultural, maybe family, maybe society, and so on and so forth. So I did not devote a lot of time to investigate you know, why, what are the factors. Definitely these are some of the factors. And uh, maybe they have picked up some good books or work with a good teacher and observe the teacher also how he or she thinks. It is quite complex and I'm certainly not the right person to delve into this, but I acknowledge that it is quite complex. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Ranji. Um, another unique aspect of your approach is that you invite us to think if student understanding can be deepened by offering space for students to work with mindfulness and beauty. Mindfulness and beauty are perhaps not the most common words that one hears in a science classroom or in relation to science education or a practice of science. Could you tell us what these terms mean to you as a teacher and why do you see these as being relevant to learning science? Yeah, uh, while uh, deciding to write about it, I use these terms to indicate intentionally to pay attention to whatever is happening uh, or being experienced, to be in the state of whatever is happening and getting involved in that. Um, that is what I meant by mindfulness, just to be attentive. Uh, there are so many distractions in a student group. It's quite natural when we have a group of students. Some activities like uh, handwork or some detailing work uh, can bring down such distractions. Uh, there are opportunities to bring in colors, aesthetics, smell, or some uh, detailing work with hand. Uh, I felt the mind, at least the way I have seen, the mind calms down and uh, which cooperates to learn. So uh, that is what I really meant by mindfulness and beauty. It is not, uh, uh, not the beauty of the space as such. Mm -hmm. uh, when, it, when we learn something, uh, it is sort of relieves. We can see something which is in a sort of final thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the beauty I'm talking about. When we are attentive, we have also felt that. Correct. 
So that's a beautiful answer. Uh, for teachers who may want to create such spaces but do not know how to, could you please share some guidance on how one can create or, you know, encourage such spaces? Uh, see, uh, it's not really so much with the physical space. I think um, physical space, I think we have good spaces in schools, in villages also. I have been to my own village and the space is, uh, physical space is good. But what needs to be encouraged is a group work in a small uh, set of students, three, four. This is what I have tried. Uh, we need to uh, do handwork with uh, different things. And the work involving uh, some uh, taste, if we can come up with some ideas. Like I have seen uh, some of the chemistry uh, introductory things where they differentiate between acids and bases is to taste, to mm -hmm. taste, yeah. Uh, one is sour and one is bitter. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so bringing in element of uh, fun, and also there is a, there is a senses involved, which is not usual. <laughs> so, um, these are the key things uh, in uh, making an ambience. Uh, right, organizing is also a key. Though I haven't uh, worked with all these things, all these ideas, uh, but you see. Important thing is for me or for any teacher to try things which works, which doesn't work. What works here in my setup may not work in a rural setup or a different school. So, but there is always opportunity to create such themes. Right, that's uh, nice. So, the other, uh, the third activity. Uh, the third unique aspect is the choice of activity itself. You know, you just spoke about working with your hands. Uh, so I'm coming to this question now. Could you briefly tell us what lithography means before we go on? Uh, just a brief uh, line about lithography. Yeah, lithography is, uh, you know, it's a very simple, uh, it, was, it was developed for printing purpose. Uh, mm -hmm. For uh, printing, it's a printing techno print technology wherein uh, they uh, etch out some of the materials from a solid thing, so it has the impression, and then they use that to mass print something. But um, my inspirations to do this activity in a sort of classroom context, uh, it was very old. I had visited visited a temple near Kanyakumari. Mm -hmm. And I saw a man sitting under a tree yeah. selling this uh, shell, seashell uh, painting for 10 rupees or something. You know, people come and uh, they draw a diagram or write something they want on the shells. Mm -hmm. And this person, this person just takes uh, nail polish and draws that painting um, and then dries it in fire and then put some sort of liquid it's in a it's in a bottle and and then uh, you know after some time uh, that's it uh, the thing is ready and it gives it back uh, ranjit i think you should show us that now i'm sure you have a nice slide to show us uh, okay uh -huh. so can uh -huh. we, can you can you see these uh, things uh, on the, yes. these are seashells. I was looking for, in fact, a darker shade of a seashell, but I did not get uh, because we are all teachers are uh, too many duties also. Whatever I got, I got it. And then uh, we started painting with nail polish, just exactly the same way the old person was doing. Kumari did and uh, yes, and uh, that um, sort of uh, remained with me. And, looked quite interesting. Later, I figured out it is called lithography. It is called lithography. And uh, you, uh, he, is, he was using some acid. That was clear long back because I could see the nail of the person is deformed. And mm -hmm. uh, that was clear to me there was some acid. But uh, later, I figured out you can do it with multiple acids. I used hydrochloric acid for the diluted, very diluted hydrochloric acid. But one can also try out... Uh, 
the home available acids available at home mm-hmm. citric acid vinegar and try see you know what it leads to so uh, that is how my inspiration and then um, as a teacher i had to teach concepts so i started yes. it just happened okay yeah, yeah. so uh, among all the hands on activities possible you chose lithography and now we know where your inspiration came from <laughs> <laughs> but have you had prior experience working with it yourself i mean before this session with the school in the classroom uh we, we i did it uh, one time uh, just to, you know after i saw that person doing mm-hmm. i came came back home and tried to figure out uh, what it is then tried out at home not in a classroom setup Uh, okay. what happened is it left out some impression on a piece of uh, marble mm-hmm. but it was not carved it was not you cannot feel it but you can see the change in color and i knew something is working and after that i haven't worked on that okay so this Never was the... <laughs> okay so now uh, tell us uh, could you list some of the concepts uh, that you know chemical reactions and all that you mentioned that you use this activity to strengthen an understanding of uh, important uh, concepts in chemical reactions could you list some of these concepts yeah uh, i um, so this happened after i started uh, structuring uh, my uh, work so um, the slides i'm sharing has the uh, concepts around the central theme which is the activity the lithography activity so various thing uh, i dealt in the class and um, for example uh, chemical reaction we write in a equation format so what does that mean uh, that is one thing the acid base neutralization reaction is another concept uh the very basic concept when they are transitioning they are learning about chemical changes that the formation of new substance mm-hmm. which can have vast vastly different properties is another conceptual idea hydrophobic and hydrophilic uh, concept can be introduced uh, without going much into the chemistry why it happened molecular uh, chemistry uh remember these are middle uh, class 6 7 8 where we have not introduced so much the atomic uh, or the molecular uh, state of matter acid to water or water to acid this is something which i uh, did it in the classroom when we uh, dilute the acid what do we do we do we add is it equivalent to add acid to water or water to acid this is something explored in the uh, lab setup usually so um, then uh, what what does it really mean irreversibility of chemical reaction these are some of ideas i tried um, mm-hmm. I'm, i'm sure if, if you think about it uh, we can put some more things around it also yeah this is a lovely slide yes okay uh, now the next question um another broad aim of the activity uh, was to explore concrete experiences as a scientist would what does that mean could See, you give scientists, us two yes. examples yes yes scientists uh, always would like to uh, want to test out their proposals they want concrete evidences or even if, even if they come up with something on their own uh, hypothesis they would like to test it out uh, hmm. and they also reason out from simple truth simple observations uh, i fi- i find that part of science is great uh, there is there is some simple truths uh, what we call let's say in physics we call newton's laws um and then they reason out with the base of that that is the base so this is what i really meant by concrete experiences to test out something in physic physical so yeah okay okay um see uh, teachers uh, okay you mentioned uh, that uh, you felt that lithography would work well because your students had been exposed to many different kinds of work artwork 
you know that they've enjoyed creating art themselves and that some of them had the practical skills needed for this particular activity. Seeing the way you think about the suitability of this activity is likely to be immensely helpful to many teachers. But not all schools may encourage art in these ways. Do you still see this activity as being relevant and enjoyable? And in what ways? Yeah, this is a, this is a question to uh, think over, think over for all of us. Um, if we look around, um, actually, art is everywhere in our society, color at, at home also. Be it uh, cooking or knitting, festival decorations, and uh, sometimes in some houses we put rangoli in the morning, different patterns. Um, everything involves some element of science. The colors, how do colors come? Um, so, if the 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 work, real work required is for us to take these into classroom. We need to transform these activities hmm. into into uh, you know stepwise uh, link it with the concepts and break it into small uh, things which can be done in the classroom along with the content, uh, or concepts that we are planning to teach. Mm -hmm. So basic integration of these things is required. Mm -hmm. I haven't tried with many things, but uh, some of the things I tried is this uh, the artwork. But mm -hmm. I think cook, uh, cooking is another activity which has a lot of potential for mm -hmm. uh, particularly chemistry teaching um, mm. because and also it is multi-sensorial uh, experience oh. and for example what does it mean mm. uh, uh, mean to boil vegetables mm. um, is it possible to boil uh, with without water there's something mm. else which has a lower boiling temperature mm. will that work so there oh. are many things uh, one can try Yes. Uh, it's not really the artwork, it just happened to me mm -hmm. like that. Okay. So this activity, uh, uh, you know, it offers students a uh, very tactile experience. For example, they can touch and feel the edge surface, or uh, draw and erase, touch up their work, uh, do all that, just like in the cooking and kitchen work that we just mentioned. So how do you think this contributes to their understanding, especially in terms of the ability to relate to more abstract ideas around chemical reactions? Yeah, I, I don't, don't, don't know the uh, details of you know, whether tactile experience is a better to uh, use in the classroom context or uh, uh, verbal or visual. Uh, but I think, I think Tactile is a much early, it develops in us, the sense of touch. And it conveys also a lot of information to us. And children like to touch everything. And in fact, we need to tell them what to touch, what <laughs> not to touch. So uh, these experiences, I feel, stays longer and tends to create lasting uh, impressions. Uh, I didn't plan for it. This mm -hmm. activity happens to be like that. Then I just took advantage of this uh, sense of, you know, they can feel uh, with hands the grooves and the patterns that has been created. I don't know what happens to their mind when they're perceiving that. Um, a lot of students in this age group are still grappling with abstract thinking. So mm -hmm. there has to be some sort of sensorial, concrete sensorial, along with you know, limited amount of abstract thinking mm -hmm. analysis. Okay. Uh, I hope it has it has, it has led to something which I do, cannot quantify. I'm sure. We'll just remember to ask your students next time we are there. <laughs> um, Ranjit, teachers interested in trying this approach in their classrooms may find it helpful to know how it unfolds in the classroom. Uh, some stages of an activity and some activities are teacher-led and uh, others are student-led. 
uh, am I right? So what criteria did you use to make this decision? Yes. Yeah, so uh, that is a simple uh, planning process before the class. I looked at uh, basically the safety uh, angle first uh, because uh, class seven, eight students working with uh, uh, making uh, diluted acids. Uh, this is a little so safety aspect uh, in my mind from the important uh, uh, this thing criteria. So I decided to do a teacher led actual etching and demonstrate that and ask them to observe each, uh, you know, everything that is happening. Uh, when I etch the thing. The second thing uh, I feel uh, after the incident, after the classes, it will be useful to understand the student's ability or even stretched abilities. Um, what are those skills? You know, if we make it too abstract, then the class becomes boring and they don't get it. So, um, and how essential my objectives are to the learning process. What objectives I set for my classroom uh, presentation. So mm -hmm. these three things uh, actually decides uh, the course uh, of how it goes in the classroom. Okay, since you mentioned etching and all those, uh, you know, very um, exciting things, I think you should show us what you did in class. Maybe you can show a few stages. Of I can. Yes, I can uh, show a few, uh, few of the pictures. Um, in fact, I have some of the pieces also, if we can see if we ca I can go and get them. So um, these are the these are the pieces of uh, marble, marble I picked up. Yes, marble uh, pieces, which, uh, which usually we find dumped uh, when mm -hmm. there is some construction activities happening. I I picked them up and just cut into uh, usable uh, shapes. Uh, and wow. so these are some of the pictures. Uh, this is uh, a twin leaf. And uh, if we look from the side, you can see those projections. And those are etched. Those are etched surfaces. And here is uh, one student drew it uh, with a flower. and. Uh, Leave and leaves. Okay. And mm -hmm. this is supposed to be a sunflower. Um, I don't know what was there in students' mind, but supposed mm -hmm. to be a sunflower. That's what she told me. And uh, yeah, the upper one is a cactus. The middle part is a cactus plant. Mm -hmm. And the slide below, picture below shows an actual story portrayed by one group. They're supposedly going on a vacation to a island, mm -hmm. and this this island had some coconut trees, blah blah blah, and they lost the anchor. Boat anchor was lost, oh. and they're stuck stuck with that island. You see, there are so many things that happen in the classroom. <laughs> and this was supposed to be a chemistry class, huh? This yes, this was the introductory chemistry class, and this was supposed to be. A solar system at the beginning oh. of the drawing, oh. but it morphed, morphed into uh, some sort of uh, uh, sun and some flower petals. I don't know what to call. <laughs> and the right, you can see some geometric patterns. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, these are some of them. And if you would like me to show, um, I think these are much better than actual pieces. <laughs> oh, um, because. Yeah. They, these are really beautiful, um, lovely. Thank you, thank you. So, Ranjit, now when students do all this, are they left to make their own observations or are they guided by teacher prompts? Uh, in your experience, how do, you, how do these two approaches influence the outcome of the activity and the lesson? Uh, see, um, observing uh, for the purpose of science is different from general observation. We, we must acknowledge that. Uh, teacher prompt is necessary. Uh, we need to direct their thinking towards observing certain things. Um, but it also should leave some openness for students to observe details. They are very good at observing details. Um, 
in some occasions in fact they are they are, they found things which uh, i missed out uh, so uh, yeah that is the format it is not free of observ- free running observations but um, it is guided it is always guided but that has some openness also okay. to bring in uh, elements which um, they what they found hmm. so when they find things they ask questions huh such an activity yeah. draw out many interesting questions and comments from students and your approach to student questions is fascinating and so unusual uh for you know for people who read the article they'll know this we could do an entire webinar around it uh, but very briefly you speak of how some questions can reveal the nature of a student's mind to the teacher this is such a natural and yet often overlooked part of the relationship between the teacher and the student could you please uh, elaborate on these kind of questions and what a teacher can learn from them with some examples okay uh, see um, yes uh, one of the thing that we can observe in this age group students is a, it's a important development that happens um, a transition from a concreteness to abstract to deal with abstractions to deal with uh, let's say a chemical equation we are writing a chemical equation Uh, that's a little bit abstract um what does it mean the plus arrow these are all figures which which uh, which is a little bit abstract it okay. implies this or that okay so one gets to learn about the very personal developmental stage of the students um and see there is a lot of non verbal uh, thing that is happening there understanding Uh, meaning via gestures of student the student when one notices uh, is able to uh, satisfy himself or herself uh, whether uh, he or she understood it or not and that reflects on the face so uh, and then uh, there is another thing that happens is arresting uh, critical questions and uh, how a student frames the questions it's a very beautiful experience it 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 talks about the very nature of the students mm-hmm. um i mean yeah that's not the class objective but if one is uh, one is interested one can see all this happening parallel simultaneously the way one student frames a question compared to another it reveals something unique about them Yeah. some some of them are able to get to the critical questions and some of them will ask obvious things that they see so these are something i found very very interesting and uh, that's that's a reward i would say for a teacher yes in, yes. in such interactions yeah thank you for asking that <laughs> you're welcome and it's our pleasure to get such nice uh, replies and so i'm going to ask you something related to that you know one of the students uh, questions was i think about uh, the white powder like substance that comes from marble may go beyond the concepts you intend to teach you recognize that these can act as the foundation for the atomic theory for example which may be better understood in a higher grade how do you address such threads in class no we cannot do wonder uh, wonders in the classroom we go according to the planning and but sometimes we should be open i i saw that you know it happening to me as well uh, i saw that you know i plan in this way but then there are uh, there are relevant questions which got missed out in uh, my planning so i did try to address it and sometimes i cannot address it i took a note i gave a feeling left the student with a feeling that this question is very important of uh, we uh, we will discuss this some other time so uh, if if the exploration is likely going to a, into areas which i plan to teach i did yeah. discuss i did discuss but uh, if it is related to some uh, abstract higher level idea um, any anyway the student is going to deal with it at a higher level 
So there is no point in getting into uh, these questions, all the questions in that classroom. So I did not, I did not engage much. However, I acknowledge the importance of such thinking. That's what I could do. And, uh, yeah. Okay, good. Um, some student questions, in fact, some student questions and responses go beyond the activity to other science experiments. Uh, correct, correct. I'm sure that happened to you too. So broadly, how do you identify such questions? Uh, I really didn't have much tool to identify this fits, this doesn't fit. Um, mm -hmm. What I felt uh, is uh, the learning objectives of teacher planning is mm -hmm. uh, quite important quite important things and what I'm going to cover, uh, what is important for the syllabus, uh, I must cover. So I had this sort of priority, what is important, what is the minimum uh, mm -hmm. that I must do, and mm -hmm. uh, anything comes, that's a choice left to me to accept it and explore or not. If, mm -hmm. uh, if, if the student is with me in my car and mm -hmm. asking me to ex explore one way or other, I may be fine with it, but if she sits in my in the driver's seat, I'm certainly <laughs> not com comfortable with her. So many times students do these kind of things. So mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. we should be aware of this. Small portions uh, may mm -hmm. be a good idea mm -hmm. um, to, to try out this experiment. Small portion may be a good idea. Uh, mm -hmm. What I did uh, in the classroom may not be the best idea, but because I was going with the flow. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So I'm sure your yeah. students are happy that you're offering them space to try out some of these experiments. For teachers, yes. uh, but what about for teachers concerned about time constraints? Do you have some suggestions on how to choose such experiments and how many of them to choose? Uh, yeah, so these are certain uh, practical issues, uh, with mm -hmm. time constraint. Um, I encouraged uh, conceptual summary. Mm -hmm. So finally, I had to encourage to write them a conceptual summary made by the student group themselves, mm -hmm. just to test out how much I reached out to them, how much it was effective, and discussed uh, you know important points. Mm -hmm. uh, refined refined summary in the class it presented to every everyone and uh, yeah so uh, some of these uh, yeah so that is what uh, i did in the class oh, okay uh, ranjit from the article it appears that you address students questions as they arose in each group uh, you know different groups you also say that many questions could be addressed with pointers that are left to students for their own exploration. I think you said this earlier in the uh, webinar too. My question is, Correct. what if not everyone gets the answers or understands the concepts involved? Yeah, that is what I, I told that, you know, there is in, it is important to summarize mm -hmm. in the classroom. It is very, very important. And also, it became very important for me because I cannot go with student summary. So mm -hmm. I had to refine that when I present in the classroom. Mm -hmm. uh, so every day ended with some summary of the classroom, maybe a couple of classes and then get the summary. So uh, it was, I hope it was fairly distributed amongst different students to mm -hmm. bring them up to the understanding. Uh, mm -hmm. These, these, uh, these self-explorations, what we talked about, uh, they were also used. I used them to engage the brighter students, um, uh, you know, yeah, so which would not hinder the main framework. Okay. Uh, one of the skills uh, you designed this activity for is co collaborative work. One of the ways you encourage this is by dividing students into small groups. The first step in the activity is for students in each group to decide what to draw. You mentioned that teachers may need to ensure that there is good understanding and alignment within each group on what to draw. Would you have some suggestions on how a teacher can help ensure this? Yeah, I, I did it in one way. I had to instruct them, but I think uh, post the event, post the class, I think I could have been much better. 
a demonstration by a teacher uh, is the best way. Mm-hmm. We give a clear demonstration and let students observe what uh, what I am doing, including the pencil sketch and uh, all those things that we mm-hmm. did. Uh, so it can also be you know recorded and played. Um, access to uh, to videos playing a video is not a big thing uh, and also uh, giving clear instructions um, to the students that this is what in small chunks mm-hmm. this is what the work today and eventually we are going to end up here that is also important so that you know there is some uh, momentum that is built uh, that also can be tried so basically uh, Sometimes, you know, instructions are not sufficient. We need to show them. So I feel a short teacher demo, which will take about 10 minutes. The etching work takes about 10 to 10 minutes maximum. So one mm-hmm. can show that, show that and they get an idea of okay. what to do, what is involved. I hope I answered. Uh, your yes, question. you did. Yes, you did. Um, another important aspect of collaborative work is peer discussion. In this context, you say it was as if the group had a mind of its own. Could you elaborate on this? So, the, see, these are some things it's like, you know, we, we call uh, chutneys in the classroom. Uh, mm-hmm. They test uh, so good on that day. Uh, it doesn't happen every day. Uh, mm-hmm. It just happens on some best time days. What happens is that sometimes a student group goes into tangential discussions amongst themselves. There will be three or maximum three or four students in a group. And when I listened carefully to such discussion, it opened my eyes. Um, one person was trying to convince another um, ab- about you know how how long the acid uh, the reaction reaction they they all can see that you know the mm-hmm. gases are bubbling, the effervescence is happening, and uh, then they stop. At one mm-hmm. point, it stops. So uh, they were busy in explaining each other that you know how they could uh, explain this, uh, and that was triggered, of course, by one of my questions: that you know, mm-hmm. do you think the reactions will continue like this, or has some sort of dead point? Mm-hmm. It will come to a stop. So uh, this person was trying to convince, and in a, in a more familiar ways of his own experiences that you know the look um, acid is dissolving something so acid has to become impure so this is the terms that the student used and Mm. would it not would it not Um, Mm. so uh, they went into so the other person has little difficulty in understanding so um, they went into a small discussions of chutneys uh, pure, uh, when you mix chutneys with rice and eat, they don't taste that sharp. So, so these kind of things, they were doing it within themselves. So, which I felt okay. it's quite nice. In mm-hmm. a short discussion, they were able to understand that, yes, mm-hmm. uh, there is something, you know, something which will, a process will come to naturally uh, mm-hmm. stop because there is no more acid left because everything has become impure. This was their understanding. But it is not good to leave it, leave them at that understanding. Right. But in the summary, we say that it is limiting because it is a self-limiting uh, process, and the reaction eats something, and then the strength of the acid. We have to give this new vocabulary. The strength of the acid reduces, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. so the reaction also comes down. So. Mm-hmm. That I think uh, was was is a beautiful eye opener for me. This mm-hmm. kind of discussions. Yeah. So I was going to ask you about peer discussion and how you know how it helps uh, students become more aware of their own understanding. But I wasn't prepared for this uh, chutney and rice. Uh, voila. <laughs> <laughs> a really good yeah. one. Uh, yeah. Actually, if we listen to students, we get a lot of ideas. Mm-hmm. Uh, what they use, what are the terms they use to explain to their friends. But I must agree that it doesn't happen every time. That's true. Okay. Uh, so when it happens, we enjoy the chutney, the rice and the enjoy. chutney. Rice yes, rice and chutney. <laughs> okay. Um, 
you speak also about how peer discussion can lead to some contextual digressions. Could you give us an example of what you would call a contextual digression? Uh, see, uh, there are related things always. Uh, so we are bringing in classroom to sort of understand things, but out in nature, there are so many things. You know, for example, limestone caves. Okay. So I came across this and it's a natural, very nat natural process of um, acid, uh, acid base reaction that happens and then the, the limestone is etched. It, in fact, not etched, it is a complete hollow. So it forms caves. So uh, they learn to relate to this kind of three uh, things, um, which I feel, you know, usually not dealt with well in the classroom context. Uh, another example is understanding uh, fire as, as a oxidation process. Uh, this, mm. this was an interesting uh, thing. Uh, someone, uh, it's not my own idea. Uh, I think uh, there, there, is a, there is a process. These are middle, middle schoolers, so they don't have much idea about what is acid, what is a base. But we have to go with some sort of uh, property of things. So okay. the idea is fire uh, separates acid from base. Oh, that, that was interesting thing for me. And in fact, we did a fire together, a bonfire together. Oh, and okay. we did show them, yes, uh, the, 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 what goes up in the uh, gases, the fumes, they, they know it, that it's carbon dioxide. And later you can actually introduce carbonic acid. So it's an acidic thing, which goes in the gas form, goes up. And what is left out after burning everything is ashes, which is nothing but a base. Mm -hmm. And one can, one can uh, you know, relate to these properties uh, rather than uh, going to the, you know, H plus ions because they will grapple again with this idea. So, so most of the um, acids are found in gaseous states. They were able to digest this. Yes, gas is going up. And most of the bases are found in the uh, it's earth crust. And later mm -hmm. one student came, came and uh, in fact, he was holding this in his mind that he said that, okay, then uh, can we, uh, when we came to the uh, topic of pH later, yeah. much later, said, uh, okay, you had mentioned this. Uh, can we get some ashes and test it out whether it is um, acid or base? Oh. This is a wonder wonderful uh, connections they are making. Uh, so again, these are also chutneys. It happens <laughs> once, <laughs> once in a while. Yes. Okay. Yeah, okay. You'd answer, answer some of your Yes, yes, yes. So uh, that uh, brings me to another question. Uh, you know, you're uh, lucky that your students and you were able to uh, look at a bonfire and come up with so many, uh, you know, uh, so many things from that bonfire. But how can teachers help connect or relate these digressions to the main topic being studied in class? Could you share some suggestions and examples? Yeah, so sometimes, you know, it is good not to digress too much um, mm -hmm. because of the obvious problem you question that you raised. Um, there has to be related if, if, the, if we, the teacher feels that it is connected, most mm -hmm. of the concepts, uh, it should not be very complex, uh, multiple, multi-conceptual thing. Then it defeats the purpose, the, it leaves the student confused. But if it is a simpler uh, connection that they are going to make by uh, digressing, I think it should, yeah, it, it goes with the teacher's feeling in the classroom. So, uh, yeah, we, we, we cannot uh, really uh, suggest much about it. But yes, uh, some okay. things which, 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 are, which are contextual but deeply related to the concept in the natural world, I think should be taken into uh, rather than always uh, being in the in the classroom laboratory uh, right. thing, which becomes uh, really tricky in chemistry, particularly. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, thank you, thank you, Ranjit. 
Now, another unique aspect of your article is uh, what you prioritize in the process of learning. In your words, getting clarity about a phenomenon is definitely valuable, and you also said it just now. But what is more significant is the way in which the mind arrives at such clarity. What do you mean when you say the, word, the way the mind arrives at such clarity? This is a quite serious question. Yeah. And uh -huh. uh, see, see uh, knowledge, I would say the ideas, concept, knowledge, it comes from curiosity to know. Mm. And there is the process of knowing and observing and ability to draw valid uh, inferences from that is, is, I feel, it's in it. And knowing uh, is also, knowing or process of knowing is also very important probably more than the knowledge itself. Um, clarity is not given, but emerges from resolving contradictions. It's a, it's a very complex process. The learning is a very messy, I feel it's a very messy and uh, has a lot of contradictions, but it has also the ability to resolve those uh, contradictions and arrive at some valid conclusion. Mm -hmm. So, bringing this element, prioritizing this element in the classroom is vital. I'm not suggesting that, you know, knowledge is not to be prioritized. I think given uh, the state we are in, I think both should go hand in hand. If we really want uh, people to do sciencing, there, there has to be this element along with the knowledge. Because we, we don't want to go and discover Newton's laws. Uh, that is not a good thing, but the the process of arriving at something uh, smaller than you know whatever we experience, it's not denied to us. Mm -hmm. So that is what I felt. The process of knowing is also very important, and they must learn that skill when they uh, when they, they they are learning anything. So. And so much of learning is result-based, you still feel that the process that leads to learning is much more important. Yeah, this can be a very, very <laughs> controversial. <laughs> uh, but you see, you see what the reality is today, machines can process statements. Mm -hmm. It might come as a surprise to uh, many of us. Machines can uh, process statements and act accordingly, draw mm -hmm. conclusions, in fact. Mm -hmm. However, it is a complex task, task to unravel the process of knowing. They also yeah. grapple with this. Um, so shouldn't we as teachers bring back focus towards this process? Yeah. Uh, shouldn't we also, uh, shouldn't we teach, uh, um, teach to fish uh, rather than give students fish? That is, I think, is a very important point. Which, which they yeah. should learn to fish rather than only engaging with the fish itself. Okay. So, so they should come out and then learn something. Whatever they learned in chemistry, the way of thinking, uh, they can apply to other things. Mm -hmm. That is, I feel, is the fundamental change that brings in good humans, good scientists, because the person learns. Okay, thank you. Um, for all this, uh, what is the role of the learning environment and the teacher in enabling this? Could you give us some practical examples of how seeing the process of learning as a priority can change classroom practices? Okay, so so the last question, actually, something is ringing. Uh, also, uh, there is, I go back to your last question. What does please. this process of knowing uh, you know, why it is useful. See, today also students, uh, if we look at, there is a lot of uh, stress in the student body also. And this process of knowing brings with itself a surprise element, a joy. When we know how to do it, things, you know, we achieve something. There is a release, there is a release, which is, which is the which is a benefit. I also sometimes involves struggles and we learn to overcome those. Those mm -hmm. are the contradictions we talked about. So it is, it is a complex thing, mixing joy, fun, surprises, difficulty, 
but it is quite rewarding to a students to go through this and the teacher also. So uh, sorry, uh, I, I that lingered no, in no. my mind. Good, good, good. You told us that. Uh, so now I'll just repeat my next question uh, you. for you, uh, which is that what is the role of the learning environment and the teacher in enabling this? Uh, could you give us some practical examples of how seeing the process uh, of learning, the process of learning as a priority can change classroom practices? Yeah, I, I think we should not move to uh, one way or other. I think knowledge is, I want to highlight the knowledge is important. Um, but the process of knowing also have to, they have to go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. uh, the environment, the ambience is not so much uh, in the physical mm -hmm. environment that I mentioned. Um, we have enough uh, of those things anywhere. Um, we need teachers also to be sort of willing to be co-learners, uh, experimenting uh, with things. Uh, we talked about uh, there are many aspects in our society. We can bring in, break down into components which can be classroom applicable to the classroom things, and um, and a platform also to share. Just like you know what we are doing, a uh, platform to share uh, experiences, uh, strategic uh, ways to uh, satisfy syllabus and time constraint. That is a big work that needs to be done. Um, we we run uh, like you know we run from. Uh, chapter by chapter, chapter by chapter. But are there ways uh, which uh, can open up uh, some whole learning, which will cover multiple things in different chapters? It's not always sequential. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, also the teacher evaluation also, you know, how a teacher is a good or not. We have to work with a school or something. So, so what does that system uh, gear is gearing uh, towards? Hands-on work is one more thing. You know, if uh, we we engage them with hands-on work, group work, collaborative work, I feel uh, these are the elements on the ambience. We talked about what would bring in that kind of thing. It need not be artwork. It could be something else, but that has to be these elements also: group work, collaborative work. They need to talk to tomorrow. They need to talk to scientists. In the other part of the world uh, collaborate work. So this is happening already. But then uh, we need to emphasize these things also. So coming back to your questions, classroom engagements also should prioritize these kind of setups. Of course, we have a physical space. It is quite nice. Um, but it's more to do with how we are we ready to experiment Learn. Yeah, I hope uh, there is some something in what I yes. Uh, there's a lot. There's so much we still want to ask you, uh, and I'm sure you can show us some more of your slides too. But I'll just ask you another question first, which is uh, about the learning outcomes of this approach. How did you bring together all the things that the students had done in class, discussed, and learned together into a coherent understanding of chemical re reactions, specifically in this case, acid-base reactions? The, uh, yeah, so I think the previous practice you know, in, in, in the first class itself, uh, I realized this problem that I need to summarize. And that mm -hmm. summarization is quite important in a group environment where there are different levels of capacities of students also. In this event uh, of acid base, uh, it was the interesting idea that I spoke some time back, the acids go up, the fire as the starting point. We started uh, with fire and it is separating acid and base and then acid uh, goes up. And, uh, so um, without uh, introducing uh, what we modern definitions of acid and bases. We talk in terms of quality. And, uh, and they started relating to the fire also because somewhere down the line they were, uh, they were asking me questions like the rust that we see on the surface, is there fire also there? 
so you know there is something happening in back in their mind uh, yeah so yes that is how i dealt with this 7th and 8th grade uh, oh. eighth grade we, we introduced uh, some of the definition modern definitions like hmm. uh, which h plus i and so that those are familiar uh, things but in 7th hmm. it becomes very very difficult to uh, bring in those concepts yes so uh, talking about qualities of uh, things mm -hmm. it help you mm -hmm. okay okay uh, so that uh, uh, brings me to a connected question uh, you talk about how this approach not only helps students learn concepts but provides students with experiences that they tend to cherish for a long time uh, could you elaborate on this why do you see this as being so important to learning Let's see, we cannot help when the child learns. Uh, there is it has to go through this uh, thing of struggle, also joy, feeling. It's like um, one can go to the peak in a hmm. helicopter, hmm. or one can trek trek through the forest and reach the peak. Uh, and uh, this is uh, learning in particularly at middle school level. It should be more exploration. appropriate to developmental abilities and should be enjoyable experience also hmm. and it remains somewhere it remains uh, they 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 remember and try to uh, see the next learning uh, in this manner they also work on that hmm. they they try to interpret in this manner what can i do with this concept can i do this so uh, it is also about building confidence and uh, enjoying to learn. why i am saying building confidence is when uh, i think you did ask me a question this gap they become aware self self awareness about the gap right. and when they are able to express uh, with a word mm -hmm. uh, which fills fills their uh, gap they feel like they said their own feeling so this kind of gives them a confidence uh, mm -hmm. which is which is which cannot come from uh, the memorization of something so they mm. remember all these things so they they mm. cherish and uh, yeah it is part of that to be uh, if you are <laughs> joyful at something you will remember true this has uh, really been a joyful experience for you with the students i'm sure and for us to listen to all this uh, about this artistic exploration so as a teacher what was your learning from this artistic exploration uh see if i have to redo the things uh, mm -hmm. the, redo the thing that particular thing today i would do it slightly different i will mm -hmm. i will i will make sure that the portions are small chunks are smaller i i will not group together many concepts but you know portion should be smaller because what happens is after some time they will get bored with one activity mm -hmm. so uh, introducing different things in smaller chunks is a good idea i also want to uh, do few things uh, uh, there has to be uh, i think good uh, element of hand work Yeah, in terms of many things, and mm -hmm. painting, doing pencil, they are they are very good at handwork. So uh, they also take a lot of pride in doing handwork. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, some of the things I would like to do is, uh, or maybe somebody can do, is the idea on uh, if we if we do this kind of let's say. let's say take a metal which is prone to um, rusting mm -hmm. we see that rust happens in, in nature so we cover up areas which we don't want it to rust but expose the areas uh, which uh, which are prone to uh, rust very quickly uh, now can that be brought into the classroom environment by you know rusting it quickly uh, by some mm -hmm. steaming or some agent chemical agent so um one art can be created with this rust mm -hmm. one some figure can be created with the rust metal rust 
the other thing that um, I, I would like to explore is um, not in particular to chemistry, but uh, uh, we see this, you know, water flow. Uh, if yeah. we open a tap, open a tap, the water uh, smoothly flows. And if we are connecting electricity, learning of electricity, you see, there is a great thing we can do. We can cut the flow by hand. We can just okay. disconnect this flow and then it should produce a sound or some mm -hmm. effect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So these are some things, you know, one can do it. We don't need really ambience for that. You know, just the ideas and willingness to explore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I am not listed everything, but you know what comes to my mind now, I'm just sharing. Okay, okay. So, uh, Ranjit, you've told us a lot about uh, you know the uh, the teacher practice, the teaching practice that you've uh, followed to encourage your students to learn so much through the, uh, the through lithography, through art. Uh, any parting thoughts you have for us? Um, I think we uh, we we spoke about it uh, that the process of knowing is uh, equally important. It is like the, uh, the river Saraswati, invisible, underground, and that process is quite uh, vital uh, to the student and the teacher. And that connection has to be there. Today, I see that you know there are a lot of there is a lot of burden on us uh, to uh, you know complete the syllabus, time constraint. So the the way is to go in a sequential manner, finish it. Um, yeah, we can finish it in one day also. <laughs> we can just say, students don't know anything. We can say that we finished this thing, they will always agree, I think. But I think it's important to bring this element of uh, knowing. How do we know things? How do we understand things in the classroom context? Uh, apart, we definitely need uh, knowledge. Uh, they need to, we don't need to uh, shake the system completely. I think there are opportunities uh, to bring in uh, these two elements, the knowledge as well as the process of arriving at that and uh, there needs to be some work done on you know uh, can be is it possible to effectively manage time and uh, syllabus uh, what kind of uh, structuring we are going to do now if, uh, if important things are uh, conceptually clear but not everything how does the school view that so these are the some of the things also uh, needs to be worked out. I see the complex, it is a very complex thing. So I would just stop here. I think, uh, I hope I'm making some sense. Of course you are. <laughs> yes. You know, Thank all you of us much. have, yes. So, so classrooms, I'm sure teachers have a lot of constraints and it really helps that uh, teachers like you who show us that there are so many things possible within that uh, structure so that's really nice and uh, thank you uh, ranjit thank you for all the you know uh, generous uh, replies that you've given to us uh, and to all of you who are, have joined us today uh, thank you uh, and if you have any questions for the author regarding this topic please send them to us at i wonder at apu.edu.in we will do our best to get them answered uh, so thank you, Ranjit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank uh, you. And join us again for our next webinar on 12th July 2023. Uh, so this is for all the viewers. I hope you'll join us back on July 12th. If you have not yet subscribed to I Wonder, the magazine, we hope you do so now. So a big thanks. Thank you all. Thank you.